Welcome to this session on bioterrorism. My name is Sheila McVicker. I'm a correspondent for CBS News. And I'd like you to welcome with me Senator Bill Frist, Senate Majority Leader, Republican from Tennessee. The senator is, I think, still the only serving medical doctor in the U.S. Senate. You know, we slipped one in in November. There you go. So now up to two. Now up to two. Senator Frist has also written extensively on the bioterror hazard and has published a book meant to uh, inform American families. I'm also joined by Professor John Deutsch. Uh, Professor Deutsch is currently an institute professor at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In the Clinton administration, he was the director of the CIA. He has been the Assistant Secretary of Defense and he has served on many government commissions, including ones dealing with the federal government's, uh, U.S. federal government's uh, response and uh, preparedness to deal with threats related to weapons of mass destruction. In this session, we want to examine the threat posed by bioterrorism, by biological agents which could be used uh, by terrorists or by rogue states, perhaps, um, in attacks, the, their nature, their threat, their dimension, the kinds of agents we're talking about, how you prepare as government, how you prepare populations, and also try to take a look at the reality of the threat um, when we talk about this threat in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the risk that it posed to human life, to economies, and the nature of it, whether we're talking about it as a weapon of terror or a weapon of mass destruction. To begin with, I'd like to call upon Senator Frist, who, unless he has some senatorial congressional colleagues in this hall, is probably the only person here in Davos who has first-hand experience of a bioterror threat. And of course, we're talking about the anthrax attacks which took place in Washington in the fall of 2001. Senator Frist. Sure, thank you. I thought what I would do is cover a little bit about where we are today, and then I know that later we'll have time for questions and a real discussion in a field that is fascinating, that began for me a long time ago as a heart and lung transplant surgeon, my life, professional life before entering public service or the politics of public service. It was uh, to fight bacteria and to fight viruses. A transplant the heart, and the heart transplants always go well, but it's the infections that, that generally are the things that people die of. And that's what I became a specialist in. Then came the United States Senate. It was apparent to, to me that, based on the intelligence at the time, that our country, speaking for America, but probably the world itself, had not really linked in intelligence and in what we knew with where we were putting resources in terms of preparedness. And this is before 9-11. 9-11 hit, and then shortly after 9-11, the institution that I, I represent as, as leader now was hit. And it was hit with what we're talking about today, and that is a weapon of bioterror, and indeed a weapon of mass destruction. We'll probably come back to what is a weapon of terror and what is a weapon of, of mass destruction. Anthrax can be both. It terrorized the entire east coast of the United States of America. It infected uh, 22 individuals, five of whom died. It caused panic. It caused paralysis. Uh, our it government, shut down the Senate. Our, it, even in the Senate, in the sense that, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't close down the Senate, stop doing business, that kept. But almost half of the United States senators were housed in a building, the Hart Senate office building. It was closed. And it was closed uh, not for a, a day or a week or a month, but several months. Just the cleanup of that building cost about probably $42 million. Uh, affected buildings down in Florida, and the cleanup of that building, eventual cleanup, will probably cost $150 million. But it's panic and paralysis. Let me make several points. And then I'll say even this past year, ricin was found in my office uh, in, in the United States Senate. So no longer, at least from the United States perspective, is this theoretical or in, in something to, to prepare for in the future. It is very real to postal workers, to the entire East Coast, to members of our government. It's had a, a huge impact. Several points let me make, and then we'll, I'll come back. First of all, if the guiding star of, of statesmanship is mortality, 
and preservation of people and life for a, for a nation. We really do need to be looking at what we're talking about today, and that is, is infectious disease, the use of infectious agents, which can be self-replicating and spread throughout society, and naturally occurring infections. We should be looking at that because out of all the people in the world, one out of four are going to die from infectious disease. It's the number one killer in the world uh, uh, today. Therefore, at a conference like Davos, I'm glad we're spending time on that, both in terms of emerging infections, re-emerging infections, as well as, as the bioterror agents. Uh, we know, and we talked a lot over the last several days about HIV-AIDS, uh, the SARS uh, virus, uh, West Nile virus, things like West Nile virus in our country, the United States, didn't exist. Yet it spread and filtered across the United States and uh, now is in 47 of our 50 states, and including the District of Columbia. Second uh, point, I would argue that the greatest existential threat that we have in the world today is biological. Uh, why? Because unlike any other threat, it has the power of panic and paralysis that can be global. Viruses and bacteria know no borders. For the most part, they can't be seen, they can't be smelled, they can't be touched. There's no geographic border to stop it. With increased um, aviation, communication, uh, uh, it is a global threat, and I would call it an existential uh, threat. We can come back to, to that. Third, a biological attack or a biological um, evolution can have a devastating effect. We just have to look and see what viruses, bacteria have done in the past. The, the flu, epi flu epidemic, pandemic that we saw in 1918, 1919, uh, infected 500 uh, million people, 50 million people uh, uh, died in the United States. We all know the impact. We look at uh, uh, HIV AIDS, which again we've talked about with 23 million people who've died in 40 million people infected today, and it will kill another 60 million um, people. We'll come back, I'm sure, in a little bit and talk about why risk is high now for a flu pandemic because of the way we live today with communication, living close to animals closer and closer. Uh, a fourth point that I, I would like to make, uh, um, uh, and then I will, I will stop, is that I believe that we are underprepared today uh, in our country, the United States, not, we're not not prepared, but we're underprepared, and I'd say globally, we're very uh, underprepared, uh, and there are things that we can actually uh, do uh, about that. We're better prepared today than we were before 9-11. We've invested a certain amount of money, certain amount of resources. Uh, most of it has been used very wisely, some maybe not as wisely as, as we um, would like. Um, lastly, I think that we will see a biological attack at some time um, in the next 10 years. Uh, with the increase in terrorist uh, uh, activity, as we look to the future where we know terrorism is going to be less state-sponsored, but with the internet and the ability for small groups to do bad things, with the fact that it's not that complicated today to take biological weapons, uh, whether it is naturally occurring things like anthrax and smallpox and plague and tularemia and, and the viral hemorrhagic um, uh, illnesses like, like uh, Ebola and Mar Marburg, um, all of those can be used as a weapon of mass destruction. So I think it, our assumption should be, uh, if we look at risk, that we almost certainly will see a biological attack. We've seen it in the United States. Uh, uh, very directly, that same anthrax, if it were appropriately aerosolized, disseminated, 100 pounds of it, you know, not that much, 100 pounds of it, uh, would kill 150,000 people if disseminated over a, a metropolitan area. Uh, with that, I will stop. There are lots of issues we can talk about today. I appreciate that Davos giving us the opportunity to introducing this for the reasons that I said, if, if from a statesmanship standpoint, if we're going to come back to mortality, if that really is the essence of statesmanship, and one out of four people die of infectious causes, and we're in an environment now where the, the, the risk of terrorism is increasing and, and not uh, decreasing, it is incumbent upon us to address this directly and honestly and prepare ourselves and, and, the, and the world for that. Thank you, Senator. Let me pick up on what the senator has just said, that he believes that there is an inevitability of some further attempt to use biological weapons. Professor Deutsch, your assessment? 
Well, uh, the way I would phrase it is uh, slightly <laughs> different. <clears throat> Seeing what the uh, activities are out there of terrorist groups, knowing what is possible, I would say that uh, responsible governments, responsible organizations must plan for the possibility rather than assign a probability which I couldn't defend empirically one way or another. What I can say, though, is, is just agreeing with uh, Senator Frist on this, that the uh, ease of putting one's hands on the technology, uh, the motivation of terrorist groups, the vulnerability of our communities, our governments, and our societies means that this is uh, a threat that has to get government attention, very seriously so. Isn't one of the lessons of what we've seen in the post-9-11 environment, the experience in the United States, the ricin plots uncovered in, in Britain, France, and in your office, Senator, which I did not know about, doesn't it show to a certain extent that it is more difficult, perhaps, than we had anticipated? It's not been clear to me how you could use ricin in a mass, massive way to cause multiple deaths. It's not clear to me that how you could find the technology, which as I understand one of the lessons we all learned out of the anthrax attacks in the United States was it did require some degree of sophisticated technology to mill those particles fine enough so that they could be inhaled. Well, uh, I think that uh, if you uh, make this distinction, which uh, Senator Frist made so correctly, about the difference between biological agents as a terror weapon as opposed to a uh, a, a weapon of mass destruction, that the overwhelmingly largest risk comes from the most infectious agent which is available to people who want to cause trouble, and that is uh, smallpox. That is the most infectious agent, and compared to, for example, anthrax, uh, where the estimate of 100 pounds leading to a few tens of thousands or 100,000 uh, uh, fatalities or casualties, if you have an infectious outbreak of smallpox in a, uh, an urban area or in a country where uh, there are a lot of elderly people and a lot of young people, the uh, uh, number of uh, fatalities can be much, much higher than that. So the highest priority really must be against the infectious agent smallpox. And then after that, anthrax, it seems to me, and then other things. Uh, and uh, we are not really well-equipped or doing what we should be on that. But a couple of points. I mean, smallpox, we do know where all the stocks of smallpox are, don't we? There's supposed to be two of them. Well, we know where the, uh, the secured, uh, uh, responsibly governed stocks of smallpox are, but I think that everybody should realize that there are places in uh, less hygienic parts of the world, old uh, graves, old uh, uh, dumps of one kind or another, where it's almost certain that one could obtain smallpox and then uh, uh, grow it to a very small amount that would allow you to produce enough amount of materials to get uh, uh, yeah, distributed. I, I, think, I think John's right. Everybody, we know that the United States and, and Russia in what are, we believe are, are secure locations, there is smallpox. What we don't know is what, Sheila, you implied, is there other smallpox out there, you know, a few drops that when we had, and remember, and I, I jotted it down, during the Cold War, not that long ago, the Soviet Union stockpiled 5,000 tons annually of anthrax and three tons, not a few drops, but I'm talking about a few drops enough to call a, a, in essence, a pandemic, a few drops, but three tons of weaponized smallpox each year. Do we know where that is? Do we know where all of it is? No. Nobody can tell you with certainty. Everybody will come and say, well, it's in two secure locations. There's nobody who can tell you that with certainty. It, it, to, to sort of separate what we're, because we've talked about the lots of different issues, I group these three different uh, agents uh, uh, into three. First of all, the traditional agents that intelligence tells us that have been weaponized in the past, have been used in the past, and therefore we should have concern about them. They're really several. There's anthrax, there is the plague, which we know is powerful in the 13th, 14th century, what, what it did. There is uh, smallpox, there's tularemia, and there's the viral hemorrhagic illnesses. The second category that 
with the huge success of the Human Genome Project and where we are today are the genetically modified organisms where you would link something highly infectious like John talked about, smallpox, potentially with something like Ebola, which we know is deadly, for which we have no, no treatment whatsoever. Although smallpox, we have no real treatment uh, today itself. And then this whole third category are the emerging infections like avian flu or West Nile virus or SARS. All three could potentially be used as weapons of terror. Only certain ones could be used as weapons of mass destruction. But you put a little bit of smallpox in an international airport and aerosolized because it's very infectious. If, if I had pox marks in my mouth, John would already be infected in this short period of time, even though we've been this close. And you put somebody like that in an international airport and you sent them back and a few days, weeks later, you had a breakout of smallpox in 10 different cities around the country. It wouldn't be just the United States, it'd be all over the globe, would be totally paralyzed. Now, we know that one of the reasons why smallpox would be so effective as a weapon in this regard is because it has effectively been eradicated. There are very few, or I believe no, naturally occurring cases of smallpox in the environment. It is certified as, a, as an illness, a disease, which exists now only in those laboratories, and perhaps, as you have said, Professor Deutsch, perhaps in graves somewhere. Uh, now, that means that those of us over a certain age were vaccinated uh, in order to help carry out this eradication. Those vaccines, still good? Our children, our grandchildren? Well, let's ask, how many people in the audience have been vaccinated sometime in your life? Everybody's hand has went up. We worked pretty good. Uh, let me just also say, when I talked about those other five agents, there is no vaccine for any of the other five agents in that first category, but there is for smallpox, and it was eradicated. How many people have been vaccinated in the last 10 years? Two hands, three hands. To answer your question, we don't know exactly how long that vaccine that you got from 20 or 30 years ago, but if it's more than 10 or 15 years, you're probably not protected at all. But it, to to stay on the subject of smallpox for a minute, and Professor Deutsch, maybe you could put on your intelligence hat here for, for a second for us, and, and what do you think the odds are of some group being able to get their hands on a stock of smallpox in secret to create enough of the virus to be able to aerosolize it and then use it? Is this something that you believe that there are people out there actively seeking to do now, something that people are thinking about, or something that there are, that there are people who are uh, ready to move forward with? Well, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to answer this as an uh, up-to-date intelligence uh, officer. Uh, I left being director of central intelligence. Uh, uh, roughly uh, nine years ago. So, but there's no question about the fact that you have groups out there, a couple of handfuls of groups in the world, uh, where they have a the capability of doing so should they want to do it. Not as difficult as building a nuclear weapon or getting access to fissile nuclear material. Another great concern of our societies. Uh, they A, have that capability, and uh, B, if they have the intention to create a weapon that will be either of this terror variety or possibly of catastrophic consequence, uh, they could uh, uh, certainly do it. And in my judgment, deliver it against the main cities of any of our countries that are here in, uh, represented here in uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum. That is why I believe that we should go back to a policy of vaccinating everyone. Now, the United States, I think, took a, you'll help me on this, Senator, uh, an early step of saying, well, we'll start by vaccinating our first responders, those people in local communities and hospitals, police departments, that would have pharmacies, that would have to deal with the first cases that came in. Uh, however, I think the fraction, it's been less than 10 percent of those first responders who have chosen to have that. So I would vaccinate, uh, uh, our urge that we vaccinate for smallpox everywhere, uh, I would urge that we think about anthrax vaccinations, uh, botulinum when it comes up. Uh, these are ways that modern medical science, with the support given to it by Congress, uh, can help us protect ourselves against at least the catastrophic part of these attacks. 
So I, I think that's uh, well overdue, uh, and I would start with smallpox. Sheila, let me jump in because I think John just hit it. As we look to the future, we have to look at intent and we have to look at capability. I didn't answer when, when you'd asked or you implied that these biological agents are difficult to make. They're not. You can take a postdoc, not even a postdoc, someone working on, on their, their doctoral degree, give them $60,000, give them a room 8 by 12, and let them buy commercially available uh, materials, including commercially available distribution type uh, uh, machines, very simple, get them over the internet, um, and you can create clearly something like anthrax, which if disseminated, 150,000 people is not, is a lot of people. One person, inexpensive. Uh, that's capability. On the intent side, again, we don't want to be talking intelligence, but let me give you two pieces of information. Last week, or two weeks ago in the United States, our CIA released a National Intelligence Council report. And these are our smart people who sit back and look over the next five years, 10 years, or 20 years, and they were looking at the field of terrorism. And their initial conclusion was, because as I implied, terrorism today is going to be decentralized as we look to the future, the internet, the capability that you have to, to be very decentralized. And their conclusion was that terrorism is going to increase, and their, in their conclusion, in their executive summary, they say our greatest concern is that terrorists might acquire biological agents or less likely a nuclear device, either of which can cause mass casualties. Bioterrorism appears particularly suited to small, better informed groups. It's these small, better informed groups that they predict will emerge over the next three, four, five, or ten years. Secondly, just so people will know, where is Al Qaeda? And again, this is not classified information, but I'm just quoting Al-Qaeda, and I quote, we have the right to kill four million Americans, two million of them children, and it is our right to fight them with chemical and biological weapons. So all of a sudden you say, yeah, what's going to happen? Nobody knows, but if you look at, if you look at uh, intent and you look at capability, you start seeing this nexus that we, or we as policymakers, absolutely must, uh, must address. Senator, I think then the, the next most logical question would be, what's the state of preparedness? How many thousands of smallpox vaccines are available, and how quickly could they be administered? Well, again, we can't just focus on, on smallpox, because as soon as you handle smallpox, the terrorist just moves on down the list. We but, talked about anthrax. What about plague? Plague was pretty powerful, wiped out millions of people at a time, and we have no vaccine for it today. In fact, of all those agents, I said no vaccine. But for smallpox, uh, each country needs to respond appropriately. So I can speak to the United States that we have uh, sufficient doses for, for people in, in America. And then you say, well, is that enough? I just said that viruses and smallpox is one of these five that's the virus, as are the hemorrhagic viral illnesses, but the rest are bacteria. The viruses, they spread. One person gets at another, and they don't stop at an ocean, and they don't stop at a Canadian border, they don't stop at a, at a Mexican border for the United States. So it's 300 enough. What is our moral obligation now that we've ramped up to have enough vaccine for everybody, because it can be used as a part of treatment? Uh, uh, what is our moral obligation beyond that? That's why bringing this to the attention of Davos, where it is a global concern, where infectious diseases like this already kill one out of four people globally, if you, if you put terrorist intent there, that is going to escalate, and it can't be one country's response. It needs to be a global response. Well, I, there, there are several points here which I would like to uh, not only agree with, but uh, emphasize. First of all, uh, bioterrorism is not an American problem, and it's not a United States problem. Yes, you have a quote there from Al-Qaeda about Americans being a focus of their uh, hatred, but every country has vulnerability here. And in many, uh, uh, there are many reasons to believe that other countries might become equally attractive targets, if not for catastrophic weapons of mass destruction, at least for terror weapons in the biological areas. And we've seen All that countries the last be, two years with uh, plots uh, in the UK and uh, in France. Should, should be con concerned about this. And uh, the second aspect goes to the state of preparedness. 
And uh, I think that, uh, as Senator mentioned uh, earlier before we came out here, that this is still a work in progress in the United States and everywhere. But if you ask, if you take a, a, a clear, objective view about what is the ability for uh, our cities in the United States to withstand and deal with a, a, a pretty significant biological uh, uh, event, uh, I would say it is extremely poor that we have not yet built into the first responder structure, the hospitals, the uh, 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 police, uh, uh, the required pharmacies, the required ability to uh, uh, respond if an event comes up. I, we've taken steps in that regard, and I, I encourage those steps. But as of now, we really don't have what I think is the adequate training pre pre uh, prepositioned stocks, ability for hospitals and uh, other uh, uh, armories to know how they would handle people, all of that is not yet, I think, firmly in place. Just to carry on with that, Senator, and then we'll open up the, uh, the, to the floor for questions, if, there, if indeed there are any. Uh, the, if, if in the United States, and using the United States as the model, we have two American experts here, um, if in fact, the first responders, the medical personnel, the emergency personnel, the people who would first come in contact with uh, victims of an attack of this kind, people who have somehow come in contact with a biological agent, are themselves not protected. And just take us through the scenario of what would then happen to that whole infrastructure that is supposed to be in position to care for these people. No, the first responders uh, uh, is being addressed pretty aggressively. Uh, by our government, or at, at least the federal government, getting funding down is the challenge to get it down to where it really makes a difference. The first responder is absolutely critical. Right now, bang, if something happened in this room, what would you do? Anybody in here? Where do you go? What do you do? Do you go out the door? And it's an agent, and it's an aerosol. Uh, uh, who do you call? What is your responsibility? And I think we all need to start with that. Secondly, who's going to come through the door to help you? Are they going to come through the door if they have not been adequately prepared with appropriate gear, with appropriate self-protection? What is their moral responsibility to you? And first responders are asking that. Thirdly, how do we equip and how do we train those first responders? practical things that we're struggling with in the United States. What kind of equipment does the federal government dictate what kind of equipment they have? Do you put certain federal standards out there that can be accepted, or do you give money to each, you know, Knoxville, Tennessee, or Nashville, Tennessee, or Memphis, Tennessee, and allow them to choose the type of equipment to have, whether it's an escape hood or gas mask or, or, or whatever it is? A whole range of issues. You have to look at prevention, care, treatment, and response. It has to be complex. And that's why I think we do need a, a, a U.S., but also a global, almost Manhattan project to address it, especially where you look where terrorism is today. You look what's happening in Iraq today with the IEDs and the explosives. As soon as one element of terrorism is figured out or addressed, another element comes up. We today, and we've got the world experts in, in, or the U.S. experts in, in the room here today, we need a system that is more flexible, more responsive from a research standpoint, from a responsiveness standpoint, from getting certain drugs, certain technologies to market quickly and to be able to adapt. Uh, let, let me, I'll close by simply saying we started some of that with a piece of legislation called BioShield. The President in 2003 proposed that legislation. The Congress passed it last year. We'll probably have a BioShield II. It does all sorts of things. It looks at acquisition of drugs and vaccines. It lowers some of the liability, uh, uh, and needs to lower more, some of the liability so people will get involved in making vaccines and antidotes and drugs in a field that's not going to be profitable to them. It looks at uh, things, how to speed up the procurement process. It's, it's complex, but we need to have a national and an international focus. And perhaps, as you said, the international focus is equally as important. We know that viruses respect no, no boundaries. We know from the experience of uh, when there have been in the past outbreaks of Ebola, as an example, in Africa, the fear that someone harboring the disease could get on a plane and reach Europe or America and then spread the disease that way. So if you have something that happens in Central Africa, you have something that happens in South Asia, 
there may equally be a responsibility which perhaps needs to be addressed. Uh, Professor Deutsch. Well, one of the uh, important problems that uh, uh, leaders of uh, uh, states and government officials face and congressional officials face is to look at this list of really uh, gruesome possibilities that are can come up and you can keep on generating them, you can uh, write novels about them, you can look at movies which describe ever progressively more uh, uh, awful circumstances. But out of that, a responsible uh, leader has to decide which are the priority concerns. That uh, The most important task here is not to describe all possible calamities that could occur, but to, through some informed manner, look at the most likely uh, 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 vulnerabilities that we have and the threats that we face and address those. And that, I think, is a, a very important feature and one that we should, otherwise you're just going to throw up your hands and say there's nothing we can do, we should go ahead and do nothing, which I don't believe. I believe that you can take steps on these uh, nearest, uh, uh, most uh, likely threats. Uh, one other point that I think is important in what Senator Frist has said, and that is the possibility of building designer bioagents that work even more effectively than, this, than the uh, a suite of uh, bioagents that we know that exists out there, like Ebola and plague and smallpox, is so in our grasp, is so possible through uh, really uh, not terribly sophisticated biotechnology knowledge uh, that we have to have a more fundamental uh, uh, approach to developing our vaccines and our uh, 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 antiviral agents. And so all efforts which the United States is doing to sponsor much more general approaches to virology and uh, 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 the, the developing vaccines is very welcome and very much uh, needed here. Uh, on my way over here, I recalled this um, experiment that was done in Australia, I guess, and published in 2001, of um, uh, mouse uh, uh, vaccinia, smallpox uh, uh, in, in mice. And a group of researchers down there put in there a cassette gene of, uh, which, which added something which suppressed the immune system, interleukin-2 derivative. So they now had in the vaccinia genome they had in this cassette which lowered the immune, uh, immune response of the mice and of course ob observed a tremendous increase in the lethality of that bioagent in mice. So that describes to you again another horrible prospect but which is certainly possible as, as uh, Senator Frist says if we uh, close the doors to the conventional agents how easy it is to to accomplish. It shows the need for doing research on a more broad base antiviral and uh, 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 vaccine agent uh, effort. But it also shows a need for uh, researchers to worry a little bit about what they're putting out there in the open literature, which leads us to a whole other set of problems for people like myself at uh, uh, working at a, at a university. So this is a very complicated. It has a long. It has a, a long-range aspect to it, to it as well. Uh, but uh, we have to start somewhere, and starting with first responder training, first responder, uh, uh, giving them supplies, and knowing what what the scheme is, as, as Senator Frist says, is terribly important. They, Sheila, just on this first responder, I need to mention. We in our country have, first of all, underinvested in infectious disease. When you realize that one out of four people in the world die of infectious disease, we thought not that long ago, 40 years ago, infectious disease with antibiotics were going to be cured. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we stopped investing our infrastructure, training infectious disease, microbiologists, and moved on. We were wrong. We were flat out wrong. When I was in medical school, HIV AIDS didn't exist. What? is what we knew. When I was a resident at Mass General, we didn't even know it, it existed. We started, started seeing those first cases in the early 1980s, and now it has killed 1 million and 5 million and 10 million and 20 million and, and 23 million, and will kill another 50 or 60 million people. So it shows the rapidity. So we've just missed the boat. Secondly, public health infrastructure. We 
And as I was in the tsunami, I was in Sri Lanka the other day with, with the tsunami, and what a great opportunity we have as a global community with aid coming in to do relief and to do response and to do recovery, but also to build a public health infrastructure that has dual use. And the dual use is what's important when we're investing, at least in the United States of America, in these vaccines that people say, you know, that's not going to affect me. We need to invest there. But as we invest in the science that surrounds the potential bioterrorist uh, agents, as we invest in equipping our firefighters and our, our police with appropriate communication, there is a huge dual use investment that has a great payout. Whether or not we see a bio, and I hope and pray that we don't ever see a bioterror uh, attack. I think we will. But, but I hope and pray we don't. If we don't, every dollar spent has a dual use as to the benefit of people uh, in our country, indeed global. You know, uh, we, we also have to be careful of one other feature. Uh, they're not only uh, people uh, on the globe, they're also crops and livestock. And uh, here is yet another possible tar target for biological agents. And both crops and livestock are especially vulnerable to these attacks. So uh, there's another aspect of this which has to be kept in mind, and that is how do we, how do we protect our, uh, our livestock and our plants uh, in, in all these countries? Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps we've got some questions here. Um, sir, in the front row, if you could identify yourself, please. I'm Christoph Koch at California Institute of Technology. Uh, you mentioned that the U.S. government now has enough, uh, enough vaccination for smallpox, which is great. But I and most of my fellow Americans were surprised to hear that during the last flu epidemic, there's nobody in the U.S., there's nobody in the entire United States of America with 260 million people with the best biomedical establishment on the planet that manufactures flu uh, vaccine. We have to go to England, and if the single side of Chiron is down, then we don't have any flu vaccines. That seems to bode ill for any possible response to any infectious disease, whether it's man-made or, or natural. That is, I think, a, a question about the, the, the way in which the pharmaceutical industry working with government, not just in the United States but elsewhere, responds to potential threats. We did touch on that briefly of the, you mentioned the possibility of a pandemic. It and is, it is, um, hits a, an immediate point because we all know what we've gone through in terms of the flu vaccine. From a policymaker's standpoint, you really hit right at the heart of something that's very sad but forebodes, I think, very poorly for uh, our research and development and obligation to our population, American people, and, and globally. And that is a vaccine industry that has been decimated. We used to have 20 companies that would make childhood vaccines in, in the United States of America. And then it fell to 10, and then 8, and then 7. And some of it was consolidation that we've seen everywhere. And then it's down to 2 today. Flu vaccine, the same thing. Most of the flu vaccine manufacturers moved overseas. Again, lots of different reasons. I don't want to oversimplify, but one of them, which Congress has to address, I believe, is our tort system that is out of whack in the country. We see it in my own field in the practice of medicine. We see it in class action lawsuits, which we'll be addressing on the floor of the United States Senate here in two weeks. Uh, we see it in asbestos litigation, and we see it in vaccines. Right now, the way our system is set up, and our, our vaccine injury compensation program, which historically has looked, worked very well, needs to be totally modernized. Because why would anybody get into a business and make a group of vaccines that we know unscrupulous trial lawyers would come in and sue for $10 million for one case? Why would anybody be in the business itself? So we have to address it. That's one example. And it's not just the liability issue, but we absolutely must address. It's also why with BioShield, which is our first crack at legislation, that we need to make it easy for our private sector, working hand in hand with government, to get involved, to do the research, to produce the drugs, to make the vaccines, to give them some incentive to do so. Because there hasn't historically been an economic incentive there, especially for the potential of a bioterrorist agent, but also for a lot of the vaccines where the liability is so high. Just before we continue on with uh, more questions, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tara O'Toole. Dr. O'Toole is the director of the Center for Biosecurity at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and she has served on numerous U.S. government advisory bodies on biodefense. Thank you for joining us. Sorry to be late. Yes, gentleman in the red sweater. I'm 
Francis Collins, uh, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. I was uh, pleased to hear uh, the positive optimism about how biotechnology is going to provide protections against the diseases that other types of evil biotechnology may uh, br bring down on our heads. And obviously, there's a serious question here about the good guys and the bad guys and who has the edge. And I wanted to follow up then on this debate about uh, to what extent uh, should this sort of research become classified, because that's a very hot topic in the scientific community. Uh, I would argue, as a scientist involved in the study of genomes, uh, of ourselves and of organisms, that it is in general a great advantage in terms of staying ahead of the bad guys if you have as many scientists as possible freely able to work on an important problem and therefore a rush to start classifying information such as sequences of uh, pathogens uh, might in fact be exactly the wrong thing to do because it would diminish uh, the number of scientists that are actually working on the problem, reducing it basically to something that goes on only in national labs under strict classified uh, situation. At the same time, I think there are certain kinds of protocols as for instance, how do you uh, take a particularly nasty pathogen and turn it into something even nastier using a particular kind of sophisticated laboratory approach that you might not want to have published in its full details in a journal that anybody could read. There's been a lot of discussion about this in the U.S. The National Academy has been involved, and I'm reassured to hear that the general sense is that those kinds of decisions about what's classified and what is not is going to require a lot of scientific input, and that's as it should be. But here we're in Davos, and this is obviously an international question as well. The scientific community is international by definition. Where do we stand as far as trying to achieve some kind of international understanding about what are those very limited kinds of scientific protocols that might be risky as far as their bioterror applications that ought not to be immediately placed uh, into the public domain? How is that discussion going in a more international scene? Well, uh, first of all, being an ex-provost of MIT, this is a subject which is of uh, passionate interest to me, and I've got to say I'm with you. Uh, although there are risks for publishing this kind of information, um, the uh, losses that you're likely to bear if the government, with its, you know, f agile hand, starts classifying this and that, <laughs> uh, ultimately I think you've got to be realistic about, first of all, there are risks that you take, costs that you take, but there are also benefits from being open, like in this mousepox article that I mentioned, which is a specific article that you might ask, should that have been published in an unclassified form? Uh, my colleague uh, Jerry Fink, I guess at, at MIT, has been a leader at looking at this, and, and I come out on the edge where I think you are, that you have to uh, uh, be more open, although that does, um, that does, you do accept risks for that. Where I disagree with you is that there are a few things that you can bottle up that will protect you. That may be true with nuclear weapons, or was true with nuclear weapons, but it is not true for this stuff. This mouse pox experiment that I spoke about, this way of boosting the uh, virulence of the organism, I think is absolutely easy to do. And uh, so I don't, if I thought that there were just four or five secrets that you could hold steady, I'd be with you, but I don't think it's possible. So I think here's another one of those difficult decisions we face. We have to recognize that uh, stopping this research, stopping or stopping the free flow of this research uh, is not going to help in a net sense. You have benefits from trying to stop it, but you also have costs, and in my mind, costs outweigh it in this particular area, in part because of the very important health benefits you get that uh, Senator Frist spoke about from doing the fundamental work underlying these uh, 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 molecular biology and biotechnology experiments. Now, others may have a difference of view Dr. on Dr. O'Toole, perhaps? No, I agree with that. Bioscience in particular is inherently international, and you're not going to have the kind of biodefense capabilities you need let alone the kind of medical capabilities we're all hoping for, unless you allow that free flow of information to continue. But as John says, it's not just a narrow piece of bioscience that is dangerous and potentially applicable to terrorism. It's virtually everything. I mean, there was a report in Nature uh, two weeks ago announcing in a letter 
not even deemed worthy of an article, um, that we can now synthesize very long strands of DNA, and we are within reach of being able to synthesize de novo the smallpox virus. Tremendously powerful beneficial research tool, but also with obvious malignant applications. The only way out of this, I think, is if the scientific community, the bioscience community, which does not have a long history of engagement with government, as, for example, the nuclear scientists do, really participate in this debate and stop their current posture, which is basically, we don't want to hear about it, we don't want to think about it, and don't you dare talk about it, dear government official. So it's really going to take leadership and active participation on the part of the scientists themselves to get us out of this wood and, and do things sensibly. Francis, is, is that going on? From your, from your perspective, you can probably speak, even, even though you sort of set out the problem, is the, uh, from your perspective, you probably interact with more international scientists than anybody in the room today. I think there's a substantial interest in being part of the solution and not hiding heads in the sand here. Uh, the research you referred to a minute ago published in Nature, uh, I know that investigator very well. That investigator has actually advanced substantially beyond what was in that paper and is now very worried about exactly what the consequences of that might be and whether he should continue to publish the additional steps forward. In that case, they are very sophisticated. It's not the sort of thing that anybody could set up in their 6 by 12 uh, uh, room, as might be the case for making anthrax, for instance. And there's a serious debate going on, uh, I think, in many quarters in the scientific community about what our responsibility is and what the boundaries are. With that, I think, though, there is a lot of anxiety that there will be a heavy hand that will come along and that will, in a very sort of unsophisticated uh, uh, way, basically knock a lot of stuff out of the public domain uh, where the net effect of that could be dangerous. But I don't agree with you that you have to worry that the scientists are going to continue to simply say, it's not our problem, leave us alone. I, I think the, uh, the enormity of the problem is too great. You know, and I think, again, going back to my analogy of what's happening with the IEDs in, in, Af in, in Iraq right now, concentrating even on the five agents that I mentioned or the, the, the more likely genetically modified or the emerging, some variant of the emerging diseases, whether it's uh, a, a um, SARS or mad cow disease, uh, if we lock down too much, and I think mad cow disease, one cow has huge economic conditions. One cow in northwest part of the United States a couple of years ago, when there are 35 million cows slaughtered every year, and everything was responded to appropriately, had huge economic consequences. We're still not selling beef to Japan uh, today, and has huge economic consequences. But it makes me think of mad cow disease. It, you know, there's a terrorist out there sort of thinking. You can have that kind of economic compact impact with one cow, and it goes right back to the science. And although that may not be on anybody's radar screen at, at all now, we know there are a lot of scientists doing a lot of great work with, with diseases like like um, Mad Cow and, and Prion and, and, and the like. Can I just ask if you think that there is a threshold of achievement which has to be reached before you get into a position where governments take a decision that all work beyond this stage has to go into a, a classified only domain? Is it the, uh, the ability to sequence a gene, for example, an influenza gene? Is it the ability to sequence smallpox? See, I think when it comes to genome sequences of pathogens, it would be silly uh, to take that information and lock it up because the sequencing technology has now gotten so widely distributed that anybody who wanted to derive that information and was reasonably sophisticated would just go and do it again. The only kind of protocol that you might worry about is something very sophisticated, perhaps like uh, what's going on with the ability to de novo, not just determine the sequence, but actually reproduce it uh, of a pathogen from basic uh, nucleotide chemicals. If that's not easily distributable, uh, should you think about whether, in fact, all of the details about how to do that should be freely available? I think, frankly, it's inevitable, and we probably shouldn't. Uh, at this point, imagine that you can keep that under wraps, but you ought to do it very thoughtfully. I guess the kinds of protocols that maybe uh, cause people even more alarm, and I've talked about this a lot with Tony Fauci, who's sort of the person in the U.S. that I think is most concerned uh, in this area, at least at NIH, uh, would be a protocol which is